Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and we appreciate you raising your health IQ with us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Today, we are going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag and talking a little bit about a lot of things. We have a lot of ground to cover, in fact, including a question about fasting. And did you know that according to the International Food Information Council that Fasting is actually the most popular diet in America. It's not keto. It's not Atkins. It's not South Beach. It's not even a plant-based diet. It's fasting. So what is all of this rage about? Well, we're going to find out today. I'm going to ask Dr. Neil Barnard. He is our expert today. He's here with us, and we're going to open up that doctor's mailbag. So if you have a question for Dr. Barnard, go ahead and post it in the comments or in the chat, and we will get to as many as we possibly can with the time that we have here today. So let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Barnard to the exam room live. Hello, sir. How are you doing today? Hi, Chuck. It's great to see you. It's good to see you, too. So let's start right off with the question about fasting. And this is a question that comes to us from Angela. She says, people are raving, Dr. Barnard, about the benefits of fasting. Are the benefits actually real or is this another gimmicky diet? Um, it can be either one, um, but overall it's real. Um, fasting is a real thing. Um, and there are uh, some fast regimens are, are, just as you said, Chuck, very, very common um, for example, uh, five and two, eat five days and then fast for two days. So um, the, typically it's not really fasting in, in, the, in that you're not eating zero food for two days. You're cutting way down. You're greatly restricting over those two days. Or sometimes people will do uh, a complete fast for a couple of days. Um, people can benefit from that. And frankly, we eat generally more than we need to. So going without is not a bad idea. Uh, where people can run into trouble, though, is they anticipate those two days coming up. So you guess what they're doing on the other five days in anticipation of it. And a lot of people can't sustain that. But I have to say where I've been really impressed with what fasting can do is on more extended fasts that are done in a very carefully supervised way. For example, there's a place called True North in California where people have a medically supervised water only fast. And these can be varying durations and they're done in various ways. But you see people, particularly people with say autoimmune conditions where they often get dramatically better. But a couple of caveats, uh, it's dangerous to do this kind of fasting unless you're, you are supervised. So you don't do this on your own. You do this at a place that knows how to do it. Um, and the second thing is once you stop fasting, you don't just go to the airport and go back home. You've got to gradually bring the foods back in in an intelligent way. And the fast does some things that are obvious. It's going to calm your digestion. You don't have things going down there anymore. That's good. But I think the big thing is you are no longer presenting to your body or to your intestinal tract lining that has to keep things out of your body. You're not presenting them a huge number of dietary antigens. I'm talking about proteins in food that can trigger an immune response. So when people have an autoimmune condition, getting the foods out of their diet for a little while can calm the system down. Like a lot of people feel much better physically and also better mentally. Good answer. Here's another good question. This one comes to us from Heroes Fit. Wants to know what is a simple way for vegans to get enough protein if they are le uh, allergic to legumes and nuts? Uh, well, first of all, I feel your pain um, because legumes, that's a broad group, all the beans, peas, all the lentils, they're all in that group. Um, if you have felt that you had an allergy, you want to be sure that it really is an allergy before you actually knock them off your list. If allergy means you're getting a little gassy when you overdo it on the beans, that's not really an allergy. That's, that's just overdoing it a bit. Um, but if you actually have an allergy, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, yep, you were wheezing, you broke out in a rash or, or, or classic allergy symptoms, and you have to avoid them. Uh, there's still, you'll be happy to know, there still is plenty of protein in certain other foods. Top of the list, the whole grains and the vegetable group. Now you're gonna have to eat a lot of these things to make up for the fact that you're not eating any of the legumes anymore, but protein wise, you're gonna be okay. Don't forget uh, your B12 though, that you still are gonna need that regardless of whether you eat the beans or not. So we just talked about one allergy. Now let's talk about another. This is a good question from Janice, who's been watching the shows recently. It says, for people who are allergic to soy, what would you recommend for hot flashes? 
Great, great question. Um, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we just completed a big study in women who had really pretty bad hot flashes. A lot of women sail through menopause without hot flashes, but those who have them really wish they didn't. Um, and what we did was three things. Completely vegan diet, no animal products at all, not even a little. Minimizing oils, so no greasy fried onion rings. And third, soy. Uh, and the soy products we used were non-GMO whole soybeans. You cook them up in your Instant Pot and have a half a cup per day. That combination knocked out the moderate to severe hot flashes by 84%, which is really impressive. Uh, for some women, I mean, they just don't have them anymore. It's, it's for quite often life-changing. But if let's say you can't have soy because you're allergic. It's not a common allergy, but it, it does happen. And the first caveat is the one I expressed earlier. Make sure you really are allergic to soy before you cross it off your list forever. Your doctor can, can easily help you to figure that part out. Let's say you can't have soy at all. Um, do the other things that I mentioned, vegan and keep the oils really low. See how that works for you. But if you are able to consume other legumes, go for it. Um, a lot of doctors have found, although soy might be the best bean from the standpoint of knocking out the hot flashes, many of them discover that there are benefits from other uh, legume cousins of soy. Black beans, pinto beans, chickpeas, navy beans. Um, it may be dose related. So if you have them a couple times a week, you might not notice very much. If you have a bit every day, you might notice a bigger effect. And you might have a small amount, but a couple of times a day, like just a quarter cup in the morning, quarter cup later. Experiment. See what works for you. I like the fact that there are so many different options there. So often people think that when they have to go without one thing, it means that they have no other options. And so why even bother? But you just rattled off a whole bunch of options there for people to give a try. That's that's very promising. Speaking of giving a try, Polly is now ready to give a plant-based diet a try. She's heard us talk a lot about low fat here on the show. And so what Polly is wondering, Dr. Barnard, is what is a good measure of low fat in low fat foods? What a great question. How low fat do you need to be? It really depends a bit on you. Um, for comparison, let's say you were switching from chicken fat to olive oil. That, that, now that's a good switch, no question about it. Olive oil is way healthier than chicken fat. Here's some numbers. The saturated fat, which is the bad fat that elevates your cholesterol, it's linked to Alzheimer's disease. That's about maybe 30% of the fat in a chicken. Not good. Uh, switch to olive oil, you cut that from 30 down to 14. So olive oil is way better. Corn oil, soybean oil, they're similar to that. They're, they're fairly low in saturated fat. But there's a however here. Um, first of all, they're not zero saturated fat. So if you're having even that 14% saturated fat and you throw that away, your cholesterol level is gonna come down a little bit more. But more importantly, oils affect your body in certain other ways. They're dense in calories, just like butter or chicken fat or beef fat, plant fats have nine calories in every gram. So if weight control is an issue, you wanna go low fat. Um, if you have diabetes, if you have hormone related problems, menstrual pain, uh, menopausal symptoms, do it not only vegan, but also avoid the added oils and you're gonna find that you do better. Now, I don't encourage you to actually figure out the fat grams that you're eating. I don't think that's really necessary in your total diet, but there are a couple of places where you might wanna think about it. If you're buying, say, produce, an apple, uh, broccoli or cauliflower or an orange, something like that. There's no nutrition facts label on it. So you don't know how many fat grams there are in it. And frankly, you don't care because there, there just isn't much fat of any kind in, in almost anything in the produce aisle. But let's say you go over to the vegan pizza aisle and you're thinking, is this a fatty pizza or not? Depends on how much they added to it. So look at the label. If it's got more than about three grams of fat per serving, I would suggest you set it aside if you're trying to lose weight or trying to tackle diabetes or something like that. So three is my magic number per serving of food. Um, I would avoid coconut oil and palm oil completely. They are almost as bad. And if you did the math and you did what I'm describing and you didn't add oils when you cook, cause you've got a good nonstick pan and that kind of thing. 
and you're avoiding the few plant foods that are fatty, peanut butter, nuts in general, avocados, um, your diet is going to turn out to be about 10% fat as a percentage of calories or a little bit lower than that. That's a good place to be. Um, and if you're thin and healthy and everything's going well, you might, you could liberalize it a little bit more without, without any big issue probably. So there you have it. All right. We have another vegan newbie uh, hanging out with us here today with the roomies. This is a question from Ida. Ida wants to know which vegan foods are good for calcium. You take out dairy. A lot of people think, well, I'm never going to get calcium again. Not necessarily the case, though. Yeah. Well, you know, the cow that makes milk, the cow's making milk and she's not um, drinking milk herself. Where does she get her calcium? She gets her calcium from green leafy vegetables and you will too. Now your vegetable choices might be different from hers. She eats grass, you're gonna eat broccoli, but green leafy vegetables have lots of calcium. So broccoli um, and cauliflower is an honorary green vegetable, but you'll also see kale, collards, Brussels sprouts on down the line. They have lots and lots of calcium. And for, for most of them, it's really highly absorbable. That's true for the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Have at them. Um, beans have a little bit of calcium too. And if you want to go crazy with it, you'll see calcium fortified soy milk or other calcium fortified plant milks. They're fine. You don't necessarily need them. Uh, my suggestion would be to have the green leafy vegetables front and center in your diet on an everyday basis. I don't know if it's a new season because it just turned fall and people are getting a jump start on the new you kind of thing before January rolls around. But Wanda is also new to a plant-based diet and Wanda is uh, 68. She's wondering how much vitamin D3 should she be taking every day? Ah, great question. Um, first of all, what do we need it for? We, we need it to make up where the sunlight left off. Um, sunlight on your skin is nature's signal for making vitamin D in your body. So if you are out in the sun, getting maybe 20 minutes, half hour of sunlight directly on your face and arms, that's the vitamin D that your body is gonna, gonna use and that's fine. But let's say you're indoors or you're going outside, but you're using a sunscreen. The sunscreen blocks the UV rays that make vitamin D. So a supplement makes sense. And the amount um, most doctors would say to have about 2000 IUs, international units of vitamin D per day as an effective dose and a safe one. If you go higher than that to 5,000 or more, there are some risks of overdoing it on vitamin D. Let's go ahead now and take a question from Dana. And I think that this is one that a lot of people are wondering about, whether or not they're new to eating a healthy diet or they've been eating a healthy vegan diet for years and years and years and years. And Dana's question is, what should you do if you can't afford to buy organic? Um, I have to tell you, um, if the choice is have... Um, a food that's got chemicals on it or food that doesn't have chemicals on it. I think it's always good to get the one that doesn't have the chemicals on it. Now there can be a price difference. That difference is gradually coming down and it's more than made up for by the fact that some foods, vegan foods in general are really cheap. I'm talking about beans and rice and a sack of sweet potatoes. These things really cost pennies. Um, and so if you're not buying the meat and not buying the cheese and the animal products, you'll be saving money that hopefully the organic uh, is more affordable. Okay, that said, if your choice is between non-organic vegetables and spam <laughs> or animal products in general, um, have the non-organic vegetables. Organic is better, but vegetables are always good whether they're the organic variety or not. So um, there you have it. I think it's always good to choose organic when you can. Um, but uh, if you can't get it, whatever vegetables there are, are good for you. A couple of weeks ago, you and I did a show where a viewer wrote in, an exam room, he wrote in asking about which foods were good to boost the immune system. And zinc came up during that discussion. And so Tamara has a follow-up to that. She wants to know, how can vegans get enough zinc to ward off respiratory infections, or really any infection for that matter? Yeah. I, well, first of all, I don't really think necessarily zinc alone is going to do it. We want to do a lot of things. We want to keep oil low. That's another reason to avoid oils because researchers found that too much oil in the diet interferes with white blood cells, which are, are the cells that make antibodies. But zinc is, you'll see it in whole grains, uh, a variety of other foods. That's really the source. I would suggest not taking a zinc supplement. One exception. 
um, you got a cold. Despite your best efforts, you're sneezing and sniffling and your nose is running and whatever. Um, you've seen at the uh, drugstore, Coldies and other brands, and they, all they are is supplemental zinc. And it's true. When you take these, it's often a little sugary lozenge and you have them throughout the day. They do shorten the cold. Um, but I would suggest not making that part of your, your daily routine. Apart from that, you want to just get it from natural foods. Whole grains are a good source. Speaking of warding off infections, we have a question here from our friend Allison. She writes, flu block vaccine is egg free, but I find it is hard to find. Flusilvax, however, is a little bit easier to come by. Is that also vegan friendly? Oh, what a great question. Um, bad news, good news. The bad news is that all vaccines are animal tested. The manufacturer may say, we don't want to do animal testing. Um, we're against it. We don't think it's necessary. The FDA will not let any drug on the market, including vaccines without animal testing. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is um, once they're on the market, they don't typically do any further animal testing. So whether you take a vaccine or not, it's not gonna affect animals um, really to speak of. Um, but are there animal ingredients in them? And you mentioned flu block. That's the one that we prefer here at Barnard Medical Center. And we stock it all the time. And the reason that people or one of the big reasons for developing flu block was the old fashioned way of making flu vaccines used eggs, one to two eggs per dose. And a lot of people are allergic to eggs. Um, and a lot of people just don't want to have an egg derived uh, substance. And so the uh, manufacturers wanted to find an egg free way of making it. And flu block is it. Uh, no animal ingredients at all. No eggs are used. Um, nobody is harmed from this vaccine. Um, but if you can't get it, you asked about uh, Flusilvax. And there is something called Flusilvax Tetra. Uh, no animal ingredients, no further animal testing. It is vegan. And if it's more available, go for it. It's perfectly fine. Second question from an exam roomie who's tuning in today on YouTube. This particular person is wondering about protein shakes. Writes in, says, what is Dr. Barnard's opinion about protein shakes? I just drink them as a treat and not necessarily for the nutrients that they have. Um, perfectly fine. Um, if it's plant protein, it's harmless. And well, you may not need that extra protein, but it's not going to do you any harm. Let me mention one other thing, though. You might say, well, I kind of like the taste. I, I'm not worried about my protein intake, but I like the taste. There's one other possibility. There are some people who find that a little dose of protein, um, plant protein, gets them on a little bit more of an emotional, even keel. I'm talking about a person who, for whatever reason, they felt like, gee, today I kind of got out of bed on the wrong side today. I've been a little grumpy and grouchy all day today. What's, what's the deal? And the next day, they get up and they do something different. They have some plant protein early in the day, uh, some tofu, scrambled tofu for breakfast or, or grill some tempeh. Um, if you never did this, you just slice some tempeh and marinate it in some soy sauce and grill it in a nonstick pan. It's kind of, kind of like bacon. What you've just done is you've, you've dosed yourself with plant-based proteins, which goes, it goes into your body and it blocks the production of serotonin. Well, serotonin is sort of your nighttime neurotransmitter that makes you go to sleep. And if it's activated at seven in the morning, you're going to feel kind of out of sorts and grumpy and, and having a little protein will uh, block that. You don't want the protein to be pork sausage um, because those things do a lot more harm than good. Um, but if it's a little plant, plant protein, that can work for you. So when you have a protein shake and you say, I just like it, I feel better with it. It could be that that little extra dose of protein is knocking out, uh, is blocking this, the serotonin production in the course of the day, and it's making you feel just a little bit better. When it's nighttime, you can do the opposite. You can avoid the high protein foods, have the high carbohydrate foods that fosters the production of serotonin, makes you sleep better. We have done close to 300 episodes of the exam room now. And this is the first time I'm ever hearing that I can recall about protein being a little pick me up and how that might be beneficial in the morning. <laughs> yeah. That that is tremendous. It's 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 really quite a surprise. And um, researchers ha have played around with 
how can different foods affect neurotransmitters? And, and this has been uh, really quite an interesting one. And I don't encourage people to just take this on faith. Try it yourself. Um, I've had a number of women who have said to me, it makes me feel on an even keel, particularly during that time of the month where uh, in the premenstrual period, they would say, I'm, I'm just feeling not quite myself. And, and, and they find that it helps then. But you can do it anytime. Let's have some fun with the with the time that we have remaining. We we have some funny questions in the bag, man. So they took their funny pills today. Uh, question from Jeannie, wondering why am I craving cooked spinach? So maybe why do we crave certain foods? I guess for Jeannie, spinach is her jam. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you said it. It is a funny question, but you know it's it's sometimes hard to figure why certain foods call to us. Um, what you're tempted to think is your body knows that you're low on something and it just kind of reorients your antennae to seek that out. And there is truth to that. Um, if you look at what people eat from day to day, their nutrient, their food choices might vary a lot. Uh, one day I'm having Italian, the next day I'm having sushi or, you know, whatever it is, but their nutrient intake doesn't really change that much. Meaning the amount of protein and fat they get very similar from day to day. The amount of the different micronutrients nutrients are getting pretty similar from day to day. Why? Because when your body is low, it says, hey, wake up. That's the food that I want. Now, unfortunately, your taste buds are easily seduced by things that you don't need. Um, you don't actually have a chocolate deficiency. You know, you don't have a <laughs> French fry deficiency. neurological mechanisms for homeostasis, as we say, but, um, but you do in fact have um, uh, the ability to sort of seek out certain nutrients. And it could be, that's what spinach is doing for you in the same way as uh, did it for Popeye. Yeah, that, that's funny. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. So uh, we know that spinach may be Jeannie's jam, but Courtney is wondering what is the one food that you cannot live without? What a great question. You know, there are so many, I, I, I'll tell you something funny though. Um, when I was a kid, I grew up in North Dakota and uh, in North Dakota, the, the diet, it, it, I grew up in Fargo. Maybe people have seen the movie. That's where I grew up. Um, the diet was pretty much the same every day, roast beef, baked potatoes and corn, um, except for special occasions when it was roast beef, baked potatoes and peas. And that's what we ate all the time. Um, however, when I was in high school, a restaurant set up on Main Street in Fargo called the Mexican Village. And that introduced me to something called the jalapeno, which all of the big Nordic population in Fargo does not eat that kind of stuff. But it came into my life. And I don't know if there is vitamin J in a jalapeno. I'm not sure why they're kind of addictive, but I got hooked on, on spicy foods. And um, that was my introduction to that. So to this day, I always have a bottle of my jalapenos that I'll put on my uh, bean chilies or something like that. Really love them. Oh, jalapenos are delicious. Absolutely delicious. Uh, I feel like there is no vitamin J. There isn't? Oh, I was, man. I was kidding about that, Chuck. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, let's let's uh, take, uh, what do we have here? About five minutes left on the show. A question from Heather. And Heather wrote in, she said, look, I have tried to lose weight in the past, been successful in the short term, only to gain it back, and then some in the long term. And now she's really taking a good, hard look at her diet, studying nutrition, and her overall health. Got a little bit discouraged, though, with what it was that she just heard from a friend. She wants to know, is it true that the body makes fat cells easily, but can never get rid of them? The fat cell itself isn't going to go, but the fat cell can shrink. Um, it's like a balloon. A balloon, may, you may never, not get rid of the balloon, but you can deflate it. Um, and that happens uh, minute by minute. They, the excess fat that you consume is stored or it's burned. And so it comes and goes all the time. But if you've had some challenges with this, um, you are not alone. Let's face it, so many people have issues with their weight and, and, and we wish that, that we could conquer these a little bit more easily. Um, modern life presents things to us all the time. But my suggestion is don't starve yourself. Eat adequate amounts, this, not necessarily overdoing it. Starve yourself like, oh, I'm feeling fat, so I'm not gonna eat you know, for the rest of the day. That sets up hunger. 
that's going to drive overeating tomorrow. I wouldn't do that. Instead, what you want to do is to be on a pretty much an even keel of a healthy diet. Go ahead and eat breakfast, eat lunch, eat dinner. Have it be completely vegan. No straying away, no straying into the animal product world. But also allow your tastes to go to very low fat foods. Many of us have gotten hooked on a certain kind of taste. You've, you've probably seen this with uh, people who want salty foods. When you get away from salty foods, the foods just seem bland, but you'll eventually adjust to the lower salt taste. You'll come to prefer it. Uh, that's true when you reduce the fatty content of your food too. If you choose lower fat foods, at first they won't seem quite as rich, but after a couple of weeks, you'll come to prefer it. What have you just done? You have set your tastes to prefer um, the foods that are filling, but not really very calorie dense. And you'll discover that if you can retrain your taste buds to prefer the low fat foods, um, you'll discover that the, the weight loss is a more consistent phenomenon and you can stay on an even keel that way. It's a good, good thing to do and uh, have at it. See what happens. You talk about retraining your taste. That reminds me of the term that was used growing up, and that was an acquired taste. As in, you may not like something the first time you eat it, but if you eat it a second, a third, a fourth time, pretty soon you're going to be a big fan of whatever it is. And it could work the other way, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I mentioned my North Dakota home. Um, in North Dakota, if somebody serves green beans at a cafeteria, you know what's in them? Green beans. But the first time I was in the Atlanta airport, I said, what's that in the vat of green beans? And the answer was a bit of fat back. And I thought, what the heck is fat back? Um, I discovered that sometimes people have a taste for, for all, adding all kinds of things that the food doesn't really need. And so people's tastes can drift in a really unhealthy direction, but they can go back to a healthier direction. When you start leaving the grease out of your foods, um, they taste better. When I was a kid, my mother walked in, the, in our house one day and said, Henceforth, we are having no more whole milk. Her idea was that we should have skim milk. And she served it, and we thought, oh, it doesn't even look right. It's kind of blue, tastes terrible. But within about a, maybe three weeks or so, a month, we were totally adapted. And one day, she poured us some milk that tasted horrible. It turned out she would brought back whole milk by mistake, and it now was greasy. Now, the point isn't that milk is good, whether it's whole milk or skim. Frankly, you should skip it all. Go to soy milk, go to almond milk, go to hemp milk, whatever it is, those are better choices. But what I discovered from that childhood experience was that your taste for fat, if you bring your fat content of your food down, your taste will adapt to that level and your weight will adapt to that level too. Let's go ahead and take a question from Jihani, the next to last question. This is a good one and one that we have addressed on the show before, but with so many people now uh, looking at adopting a plant-based diet to help with their diabetes. It's an important question as ever. Gianni, I went vegan about a week ago and I do have diabetes, but my blood sugar in the morning has improved for the most part, but some days it's still a little high. What could be causing this? Okay. Um, let's assume if it's type two diabetes, um, it is type two. Di okay, great. Uh, type two. I, I don't mean great. I mean, I'm sorry that you have to deal with it, but, but it can improve dramatically. Um, Type 2 diabetes starts out as insulin resistance, which just means that your cells are filled with, with particles of fat. You can't see it. It's, it's inside your muscle cells or inside your liver cells. And as fat has built up over the years in those cells, your insulin isn't working very well. And what that means is then you'll eat some bread or some rice or something that shouldn't cause a problem, but it makes your blood sugar spike because it because that sugar that comes from the rice or bread can't get into the cell where it belongs. Now you're on a vegan diet, hopefully a low fat vegan diet. The fat that's in your cells will start to dissipate, starts going to start going away. When that happens, your natural insulin will work better and it can bring the sugar out of your blood, pack it into your cells and your blood sugar is going to go down. Now this will change from hour to hour and day to day based on what you eat. But if you avoid animal products completely, there's, then there's going to be no animal fat in your diet. Keep oils low. There's not much of any kind of fat in your diet. Um, stick with that. You will discover bit by bit, your blood sugar will get under better and better and better and better control. Make sure your doctor knows that you're doing this if you're on any kind of medication because your need for medication is likely to drop.
If we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. And also, if you unfortunately right now are experiencing hot flashes, have no fear because relief could be on the way. Dr. Barnard, on the heels of your book, Your Body in Balance, comes the 100% free uh, Fighting Hot Flashes with Food class series. And that's beginning on Tuesday, October the 2nd. Absolutely free. A four-week series that's really going to offer a lot of women who are suffering right now some help. I'm really hoping people will join us. It's free. It's uh, invigorating. We're going to knock out hot flashes, but we're going to feel a whole lot better in general. No doubt about it. And we're going to put a link to register absolutely F R E for free in the episode notes. So make sure that you check out that series. And also, Dr. Barnard, we can't finish today. You, you said thank you to Allison earlier in the show, and let's do it formally now. A big thank you to the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for their support of the exam room. The Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund, if you're not familiar with them, what they do is they support organizations like the Physicians Committee that carry on the love that Greg had for animals, which was second to none. And they do that by promoting a plant-based lifestyle and tackling animal welfare issues. And if you would like to support the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund, I encourage you right now, head over to their website, GregoryRyderFund.org. That's R-E-I-T-E-R, GregoryRyderFund.org, and sign up for the newsletter while you're there. And Dr. Barnard, that is all the time that we have today, my friend. I appreciate you hanging out and answering so many questions for the roomies. It's been fun. Thank you so much, Chuck. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. We'll do it again soon. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for watching. Till next time.